19. I'm going to share the screen with you and we'll get going then with our Bible study here on John. And of course, we do memory work first. So let's do memory work first. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, may have life in his name. Great. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Good. And then the, the other one that we have, so that's the end of John, it's the first of John. The word became flesh and made his dwelling, his tabernacle, remember, dwelling with us. We have seen his, ah, that's the big word, remember, okay, we have seen his glory, the glory of the only begotten, thank you very much, monogenes, the one and only, John 3, 16, remember that, okay? So we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. All these, these big um, loaded words that we have with, with John. All right, very good. So we've looked at a lot of I am statements. We're finally in chapter 15. Okay, and if you notice up here, as far as the I am statements, uh, John 15, we get kind of the, the last of the I am statements that we have. I am the true vine. And so we'll, we'll take a look at that. I am the true vine. All right. So again, just kind of quickly reviewing, because I'd like to get in chapter 15 as soon as we can. But remember, he's going to say this again, the exact same thing he's going to say in chapter 15 of what he has here in 13. You don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. Oh, what a precious gift that that is. Whoops. Where are we going here? Am I doing too much? Daniel, what's going on? Oh, we pulled up a different one. That's the wrong one. Do we have chapter 15? Or did you get 14? All right, should, should be John 15, would you? All right, because that was 14. That was last time's, so, all right, that, that we were looking at. Well, I saved it in volunteer. It's, it's in um, uh, whatever that volunteer drive, top one, that's there. Okay, folks here see it. <laughs> on the computer, they got, they got it right on the computer. I'm sorry, Jamie, I should have double checked that. We started right. What's well, the John 13 passage where it talks about, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will understand. And how marvelous that that is. Because what is happening here? The disciples, don't let your hearts be troubled. John 14, right? Don't be anxious. Believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house are many mansions. Yes. No, you got it. Thanks, Jamie. That's it. All right, good. So you don't understand now, but you will understand later on. All right, we're going to look at that again for a little bit later on. Good. And then also, oh, Connelly, I'm going to blame it on you, but why are we not? at home now, doing what we need. Oh, there it goes. All right, again, you don't understand now, but you will understand later. Why didn't they understand? The Holy Spirit hadn't come yet. What'd you say? It hadn't been revealed yet, all right? It was still coming, the glory was still coming and so on. And what are the disciples all thinking? He washes their feet, and what are they thinking? What are you doing that for? Only the lowest one does that. He talks about, I'm leaving and I'm not gonna be, I'm gonna be with you only a little longer and then I'm gonna be going and, and where I'm going, you can't come now. And you remember all this stuff that he's been telling them? So what's happening? I mean, their minds are spinning, I'm guessing, all right? And so don't let your hearts be troubled. Yeah, the, well, okay, trust in God. So the thing to do is to trust in God. All right, good. Trust in God, why? Because I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is all John 14, review again, all right? All right, um, show us the Father. Well, don't you know that um, I and the Father are one and so on, and um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Keep that in mind, all right? The truth, because when we look at the true vine, we'll come back to this, the truth, 
Okay, good. So we've looked at that. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. John 14, again. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. I give to you shalom. And we looked at that word shalom much more than just lack of war. <laughs> as far as the world talks about it. The peace that the world gives is no true peace at all, certainly not lasting peace that's there, but not as the world gives. And so we have all of these um, already in Isaiah, back in the Old Testament. All right, again, all of this is, is review from John 14 as we talk about it. So now we can get to John 15. So John 15, start at verse one, and just, if you would please, and I need to remind myself too, you know, we're, we're kind of piecemealing this a little bit, but Jesus says all this at one time. Don't let your hearts be troubled. <laughs> you know, he has to stop and say, this is what it means. But he's saying all of this. And so John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 are all kind of one thing. All right. So John 15, somebody read for us. If you got a microphone. Okay, Mark, you got one? okay good. Would you do about the first four verses for us, would you? I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Okay, so we're going to use the word abide. Mark, what translation are you using there? ESV. ESV uses abide. NIV uses remain. All right, I just mentioned that because we're going to be talking about a lot about remaining and so on. Okay, what do you know about the Old Testament and vineyards? Communion? Okay, that's New Testament. What do you know Old Testament and, and vineyards? On them, they, drank wine. they drank wine and they depended on them. They were very, very important. Yes. Okay. What else do you know about vines and, and Old Testament? Ah, let's look at it in just a minute. But before we do that, let me get take care of this one up here. All right. There's a lot in the Old Testament, by the way, about vineyards. And I'll, I'll share that with you. And that's why Jesus uses this. But first, let's just talk about this. What's the difference between pruning and cutting off? Good. Pruning is to make it grow more, to be more fruitful, and cutting off is to kill them. That's right. So are you pruned or cut off? I hope you're pruned. Yeah. How are you pruned? Well, okay, take away the sin. Maybe not so much just taking away the sin, but... To be more fruitful, how can how are you pruned to be more fruitful sometimes? I think by trials. And trials tribulations. and tribulations. Thanks, Connolly. Yeah, trials and tribulations. Maybe our focus is heading in the wrong direction and our focus is too much in one direction or whatever it might be. And, and God comes in and he says, oh, I love you too much to have you stray in, in this way. And so I bring it back again. Or it might be, you have a strong faith and I'm gonna make it stronger. And I'm gonna make it stronger by you having to trust 100% in me because it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. One of the things about this is talking to Christians, all right, talking to mature Christians, when trials and tribulations come, that when you get a chance to, talk with them about what this pruning is doing. How is this pruning happening? It's not cutting you off, but it's pruning. But I wanted to talk about that first because both of them sound the same, don't they? Prune or cut off. But we'll, we'll look here, and um, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit on, on the seat there, but Judas was pruned or cut off? Cut off. Peter was pruned or cut off? Pruned. So we have two examples already that he's talked about here as far as his disciples and those who were with him. And so he says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. You've got it up there on the, on the screen there. And what does my father do? He wants to have a fruitful garden. 
And so I guess agriculturally, you know, uh, dead branches on a, on a vine or a tree or whatever can make the tree sick, can uh, diseases come in there and so on. All right, so we got all that kind of stuff. Very good. All right, so how about Old Testament? What do you know about vineyards in the Old Testament? Do you know Isaiah 5? We had it as, actually, I, I preached on it here probably not too many Sundays ago. It was in our, our scripture readings and so on. I will sing a song of my vineyard. I planted a vineyard. I put hedgerows around it. I, I put a tower up there and so on. And all you did was you gave bad fruit. Who's the vineyard? Israel. Israel. The vineyard in the Old Testament was a symbol for Israel. Kind of like the American eagle is a symbol for the United States of America or maybe Statue of Liberty. I don't know what, what would be some symbols for the United States of America. But this whole thing, Solomon's, not Solomon's temple, Herod's temple, when they, when they rebuilt Herod's temple, man, there were vines and grape vines and so on all around because it was that, that sign for, for Israel. And so Isaiah talks about it. Jeremiah talks about it. He says, I planted you like a choice vine of sound and reliable stock. How then did you turn against me into a corrupt wild vine? So Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Hosea. Hosea even talks about it. Israel is a spreading vine. He brought forth fruit for himself as his fruit increased. He built more altar sacred stones. Oh no. And their heart is deceitful. Now they must bear their guilt. The point I wanted to make here is, as Jesus is talking to his disciples here, and he says, I am the true vine, what was the false vine? Old Israel, okay? And so who is Jesus? Israel reduced to one. Have I ever told you that? It is so helpful for understanding Old Testament and fulfillment of that. You know, Old Testament Israel was called to be a light to the nations, was called to, to, to help the nations come and know the true God, but they failed and they failed and they failed and they failed and they failed. And so the Israel reduced to one, Jesus, the true Israel had to come. Here it is. I am the true vine. The old Israel, not now the new Israel. Okay? So all of this, all right? You don't have a, homica, or a yarmulke, all right? A Jewish beanie, you know, uh, we're not Jewish. But if, if we were Jewish, you know, we would pick up on that whole vineyard thing and, and vine, uh, hopefully, a lot more, all right? Since we're Gentiles, we have to be told that. All right, good. All right, good. And so bearing fruit is, is what's most important. How about Jesus' parables? How many times does he talk about a vineyard in, in his parables? Just say lots. I've listed a few of them up here. And just interestingly, notice in Matthew, so we got Matthew 20, we got Matthew 21. We actually have two in Matthew 21, and then we have one in Luke. So Jesus loves to use this image because the Jewish people are saying, oh, he's talking about me, the vineyard that's there. And so I am the true vine makes a bunch of sense to the disciples here, probably more so than maybe for us as, as we have this, just like shepherd and, and sheep and so on that would have been there. Okay, did I make my point? <laughs> All right, so how much in the Old Testament? Lots. And so what have we got? He looked for a crop of good grapes, but he yielded only bad fruit. All right, and so we need to have a true vine, and that's who Jesus is. So we've got, I am the truth, I am the true light, I am the true bread, I am the true vine. Again, this is a Johnish thing, as you can see. Jesus talks about being the one and only, the reliable, the true one. There's others, but he's the one and only. All right? So the true vine that's here. Great. And the reason for that is, if he's the true vine, there's some other vines out there. And so there's other vines, and if you're attached to those other vines, apart from me, you can do nothing. We're going to talk about bearing fruit in just a little bit and what it means to bear fruit. And here it is, as Jesus is talking about this, what's the only way that a person can bear fruit? 
if they abide or remain, all right, since the ESV talks about abide, that if you abide or remain in Jesus, works well with a, with a sermon for today too. Yeah, Anne. Okay. Yes. It says, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Yes. Because the vine is Jesus and the branches are us. And so the branches would be attached to the vine, but the vines, sorry, the branches that don't bear fruit, he cuts off. Yeah. He's talking about hypocrites. He's talking about those who say, well, I'm a Christian, or I'm an Israelite, or I'm a Pharisee, or I'm a, and it's not, you just can't say that because you're sons of Abraham, all those kinds of things. Well, and this is also before Judas had betrayed him, wasn't it? No. Uh, well, Judas has gotten the money. He is left and, and you know, remember Jesus says back in chapter 13, whatever you're going to do, go out too quickly. Judas has left now, and so he's on his way. He's, he's ready to. He hasn't come to the Garden of Gethsemane yet. This is in between times when he sent Judas away and, and before he comes into the garden. So... I understand what you're saying. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I was hoping I understood what you said. Yes? Okay. All right. Good. Good. Yeah. Good question, Ann. So um, attached to the vine, and so he cuts off those that don't bear fruit. Wow. Okay. So this bearing fruit then, how important it is to remain or abide in him. What's kind of fun, and I don't know who did this slide, but it's, it's really kind of neat. Notice, you got to read it across. So you got, well, I better read it over here. Jesus says, remain in me and I will remain in you. The branch must remain in the vine. There's no fruit unless you remain in me. If you remain, you'll bear much fruit. If you don't remain, you'll wither up. So remain in me and my words will, all right, you get it. All right, change it to abide if you want to. But the point that Jesus is saying here is, I am the true vine, and the only way you're going to bear fruit is remaining, abiding, staying attached to me. And when you stay attached to me, if you bear no fruit, I cut you off. If you do, what can you expect? Pruning. All right. And so we have this, this beautiful example. When is Jesus saying this? on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane, or maybe at Gethsemane or whatever it is. Remember last time we finished it up with, come now, let us leave. They left the upper room, they're heading to Gethsemane. Probably there were vin vines and, and, and whatever, maybe in the Garden of Gethsemane, something like that, all right? So he's using these uh, lots and lots of, of, of images and, and the like. Apart from me, you can bear no fruit. When you produce much fruit, you are truly my disciples. I decided I'd put strawberries up there. There were also apples and there were others. But the reason why I wanted to do that is, you know, a grapevine are grapes. But how many different fruit do we bear? Each of us bears a different kind of fruit, isn't it? And isn't that great? We need to have all the different gifts and all the different fruit bearing that happens here. And so as we talk about that, hey John, good to see you. As we talk about the different kinds of fruit that we bear, then let's talk about how it is that we bear fruit and as Jesus does this. So let's continue on then. So we've got this, all right, if you abide in me and so on. So verse five, somebody pick it up again. All right, go ahead. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so fruit my disciples, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. 
If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I'll stop you there. Good, through 14. All right, thanks, Mark. All right, very good. Kind of a longer section, but I wanted to get all of that because now I want to ask you as what Jesus says, unless you remain in me, you will not bear fruit. So what's the fruit that he's talking about uh, bearing? Take a look. I've, I've got it up here on the screen for you as well. So what does it say? Abiding in me. So you bear fruit when you remain in Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? And so it's not, oh man, I have to go out and knock on doors and ask them if you were to die tonight and St. Peter met you at the gate and then ask you, why can you get, you know, remember that, that whole candy thing that was there? And, and I don't know, I always felt guilty about, you know, we need to get people out there knocking on doors and so on, that somehow that that was, you know, a, a good fruit or something that you're supposed to be doing. But what does it say? First of all, Bearing fruit means abiding, remaining in Jesus. That's what we're doing, right? Bible study? Sure, and, and continue with that, good. Also, when you bear fruit, you're gonna have joy. Don't you love that? Where it talks about um, this, this whole thing about, about joy. Um, all right, what verse is that? 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. As you're bearing fruit, it's fun, it's joyous, it's, it's happy. So the Sunday school teacher who loves teaching Sunday school is bearing fruit. The Sunday school teacher who hates teaching Sunday school and is just doing it because nobody else will do it, eh, all right, probably not bearing fruit. Uh, altar guild that serves altar uh, uh, lovingly and so on, all right, is bearing fruit that's there, the teacher, the doctor, the, the nurse, the, all right, so whatever it is that God gives us to do, and we do that because we're remaining in Christ and so on. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might that's there. And so how do you bear fruit? I bear fruit by doing the things that God has called me to do. Okay, good. So here we have it. So, um, oh, I, I skipped the love each other, sorry. And that comes first, doesn't it? And so as my father has loved me, verse nine, so have I loved you now, abide in my love. How do you bear fruit? By loving others. Now he's gonna talk about obeying my commands. Put those two together. What's the summary of the 10 commandments? Love God and love neighbor. Ah, so how do we obey his commands? By showing love to our neighbors. Great. And so we've got these, bearing fruit is not a hard thing. Bearing fruit is something that a Christian will naturally do. Do you remember Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10? Verse 10 especially, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do the good works, the bearing fruit that God prepared in advance for us to do. So as we live our lives as Christians, as we do the day-to-day -day kinds of things that God gives us to do, and we find joy and enjoyment in that, hopefully in our work and our play and our activities and so on, we're bearing fruit, okay? We're not bearing fruit in the sense of reaching out to others and bringing them to Christ. We're only by our actions of ourselves. In other words, we're given a talent or a skill and when we're in Christ, we do it joyfully, and we show that joy in what we do, and then people say, well, okay, what made you so happy today? Or, yes, yes. But it's, I, I, I guess I thought of bearing fruit meant reaching out and bringing people to Christ. And how do you do that? I guess in the way we behave. Ah, uh, the way we daily. Behave, the way we talk, the way that our attitude is, all of these kinds of things, and it's not a set way. You have to, Dr. Ross, you have to ask every patient that comes into your office, do you believe in Jesus? You know, that's, that's not necessarily very true, but showing the love of Jesus, being the love of Jesus, and as they ask you, 
And as you have those, yeah, very, very good. Sometimes we think that, don't we? Bearing fruit, oh, how many people did I bring into the church this year? Let's see, oh, I wasn't very fruitful, let's see. Well, that's not it. It's all about serving in that way. Yeah. Doesn't that free you up a whole bunch? <laughs> yeah. To the church. Because? Well, because really, that's the, the, the Lord. You know, you present the word. That's the fruit. Got it. The Lord brings the results. Got it. And uh, if that person refuses to follow the Lord's leading, that's not your fault. There you go. Very good. Yeah. Not notches on my belt. I don't know. Did they do that? That was killing somebody, wasn't it? That's probably not a good suggestion. Or if they come to the church, that's not our credit either. Okay. If they come to the church, that's not our credit either. Yeah. It's the Holy Spirit working through the word and so on. But yeah. All right. Good. That's good. This joyfully and cheerfully <laughs> will bring people to the church. Okay. They can see the joy of uh, being a, a citizen of the United States and exactly. right here at Holy Cross. All right. Very good. We got the plug. All right. We'll have that commercial a few more times. I have a, a feeling. All right. Good. So do, do you see this as far as bearing fruit? I, I wanted to talk about that because sometimes we have this idea that, you know, bearing fruit means you know, how many people have I brought to Christ or how many people have I, have I, have I. Wait a minute, whenever the focus is on me, I'm in trouble. The focus always needs to be on Jesus. Come on, man. you got it. All right, absolutely. So bearing fruit is living for Jesus. I don't know about you, but that's really freeing for me and, and it, it certainly makes it a lot easier and, and more joyful to do.